Hello and good evening. Welcome to Paradise, Inside California's Deadliest Wildfire. My name is Liz Weil, and I'm a reporter with the independent newsroom ProPublica. Uh, and I'm pleased to be moderating my first Commonwealth Club, particularly because we're here talking with my friend and colleague, Lizzie Johnson, who's here to discuss her incredible new book, Paradise, One Town Struggle to Survive an American Wildfire. Lizzie wrote this book while she lived in the Bay Area, and she has since moved to Washington, D.C. to work at the Washington Post. Um, this book, as I'm sure you all know, could not be more timely. There are wildfires all over California. You can smell smoke almost everywhere in the state, and it's been like this in the late summer and fall for the past couple of years. So her book, of course, is about the town of Paradise and the devastating fire there in 2019. This program is digital, but the club has is doing safe in-person programs at its headquarters across San Francisco. To learn more about upcoming programs and how to become a member of the club, visit www.commonwealthclub.org. Okay, with that introduction out of the way, one more quick bit of housekeeping as we get started. If you have any questions for Lizzie or me, please use the YouTube chat feature. Questions asked there will be submitted to me throughout the program, and I will try to ask as many of them as I can. So with that, off we go. So one more thing. You should all know that Lizzie is just about the most talented and most delightful reporter out there. And the last time I saw her, she was off to do the Muir Trail. So she is intimately acquainted with all parts of the state. But to get going, what are you hearing from Butte County right now? You spend a tremendous amount of time there. Yeah, you know, it, it's, I think that's been one of the hardest things lately is so many people from the campfire are struggling to rebuild their lives still. And it's hard for them to see smoke in the skies again and worry about their communities again, because, you know, the Dixie fire is up there and burning. So, you know, people are sending me pictures of their kids, sending me um, predictions of what the fire is going to do next. And it just feels like, you know, another summer in California, another fire and people are really freaked out. So tell me about heading up there for the very first time to paradise on day one. Yeah. Um, so I had been covering fires for a little while before paradise and, you know, summer in California, you're a reporter and you know, you're on call. Um, I still, it was already November at that point. So I was like, okay, maybe this is more normal and I won't be getting these morning calls anymore about <laughs> a fire starting, but Lo and behold, bright and early, my editor called me and was like, hey, I, there's this fire that started near a town called Paradise. Can you go? And so in those moments, you know, you just get in your car and take off. I keep a whole bunch of food in my trunk and clothes. And so I was like, okay, I've never been to Paradise before, but I guess we'll, we'll see what happens. And it quickly became very clear a few hours into the drive that this was not a normal fire. I just remember driving up north from Sacramento and there was just like this big column of smoke in the sky that looked more alive than any smoke column I'd seen before. I describe it as like pie crust. Like there was this clear line between, you know, the cornflower blue normal sky and then, you know, this dark purple and blue and navy. And um, the closer you got, the more the light just disappeared until all you could really see were the headlights of people trying to get out. And you know, you just knew that underneath all of that darkness was a really, really bad fire. So how did you start reporting? You had to probably be the most experienced fire reporter out there, given that I think you were the only full-time fire reporter in the country. Is that right? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Um, so how did you begin and what did you know to ask and look for? Yeah. I mean, I think with anything that's that big, you, you start by like drawing a circle and just going closer and closer until you figure out what the story is. And so with fires like that, it's, you know, getting as close to the fire as you can and then going to evacuation centers, trying to talk to people who had just escaped. And so one of the very first interviews that I did was at this evacuation center. And I think it was in Warville maybe, but this woman her clothes were like crunchy because she had been in a stream sheltering from the fire. And I remember talking to her and being like, that, that can't be right. But like her clothes were kind of like crunchy and muddy from having 
having sheltered through the fire in this stream. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is just insane. And then more and more stories like that kept emerging. And um, you started really realizing what the human toll was going to be if you were talking to these people who did make it out, right? And when did that toll really start to become apparent to you? Yeah. Um, So later that evening, I went to the first press conference. It was in the basement of the Butte County Sheriff's Office. And I remember going down into that basement. It was these like steep metal stairs and they had all of these chairs set up, but there were only like three reporters there. Um, The fire had just hit so fast that I think that uh, the speed, along with the fact that the Woolsey fire was burning down in LA, people just hadn't quite caught on yet the fact that paradise was pretty much gone. And um, the sheriff went up to the podium and he just kind of had this glassy look in his eyes. And he he basically admitted that there were fatalities and there were a lot of them, but they couldn't get to the the remains yet. Um, They couldn't get them out safely. And then behind them, behind the sheriff was just a line of all of these officials who also had that kind of glassy look in their eyes. I remember specifically there was a a local county supervisor who just had soot caked onto his skin and he had, you know, gotten a ride out of the fire in, I think it was a bulldozer. And again, just like insane, like this isn't how press conferences normally go. This isn't the kind of story you typically hear after these fires. And again and again, I was just like, this is not like any fire I've ever covered before. And then how long did you stay on that first trip? I, For those of you listening, is a tenacious reporter and goes and stays and learns everything. Yeah, um, I, I can't remember exactly how long it was, but it was, it was long enough to the point where my, my, my boyfriend at the time was like, so are you going to come back eventually? <laughs> like, <laughs> it would be nice to see you again. And I was like, oh, I should probably go home, but... I think, you know, in the early days of a disaster like that, everything just feels so raw and so poignant. And it's hard to rip yourself away from the story like that when when you feel like you have a purpose and that, you know, you're holding the mirror up so that other people can see what's actually happening and what it means. Um, I will say that that first week that I was up there, I was filing a story a day. I embedded with a search and rescue team. I went out with a chaplain. Um I went out with police officers who were trying to patrol this ghost town. I wrote the Chronicles big Sunday A1 TikTok, basically explaining how the fire moved through town. And um, was, yeah, it was, it was exhausting, but very meaningful. Your book is filled with incredible characters. So how did you go about finding people to carry the story? And how did you even think about what kinds of stories you felt were important? Yeah. You know, I think that as a journalist, when you're writing these stories, you, you want the people in them to resonate with readers. You want the readers to really care about them and, un- and understand them and care about their well-being and, you know, whether they're going to make it out of the fire or not. And so I did so many interviews for this book, um, I went to the the post office and stood there as people were getting PO boxes, realizing that they weren't going to have a home or an address to go back to. And the closest thing to a home they were going to have was this little PO box where they could reliably get mail, Um, went to evacuation shelters, went to checkpoints, went up into town to where people had stayed, trying to find those people who had a really rich and vibrant story. Um, And through all of those interviews, there were a few people that really stuck out to me. They had the kind of stories that I found myself thinking about late at night. Like I couldn't stop thinking about what they had been through. And I feel like that's really the sign, right? If their story is keeping you up at night, then it is a story that will keep readers up at night as well. And so one of the first people I talked to was this woman named Rochelle, and she had just had a baby 12 hours before the fire. Um, So when the fire hit the town, she had her her tiny son and she had just had a C-section, so she couldn't move that well. And she sent her husband home to check on his mother. They were afraid that she would sleep through the fire and not make it out. And so poor Rochelle got shoved into a stranger's car and was racing to evacuate 
town and they didn't know if they were going to make it out. And so I think the moment in that fire that still just haunts me the most is the fact that she and this guy were sitting in the car and had to make this awful decision about what was going to happen to them if they couldn't escape. And she told me, she was like, look, I like looked at him and told him if it came to it, please just take my baby and run. And I think that, you know, from the outside looking in, when you're trying to understand what these fires mean and what they feel like, it's in moments like that, right? Where, you know, this woman didn't think she was going to survive and realized that she would rather have her son live than, you know, risk both of them burning up. Can you tell us a little bit about the bus driver? Yeah. So Kevin is also one of the most incredible people that I've met at Butte County. He used to work for a Walgreens as a manager. And um, after his dad died of cancer, he realized that he really wanted to change his life and do something he was passionate about. So he quit his well-paying job and decided to go back to school for his high school uh, teaching degree. And as part of that, he got hired as a bus driver working part-time for the district up in paradise. And so on the morning of the campfire, he was on this bus and um, had 22 little kids and two teachers in the back and was trying to figure out how to get them out of town. He had the teachers write these three manifests of names because he was convinced that the only thing getting pulled off that bus were going to be bodies. And then there is a moment where he literally took the shirt off his back and helped rip, rip it into tiny squares that the children could breathe through masks. They were starting to get sleepy from the smoke. And again, just like another one of those stories that just kept me up all night thinking about what that must have been like for him, you know. Those moments as a reporter, I feel like every reporter has had them where somebody starts telling you something in some detail, like writing the manifest or ripping the shirt sticks with you and you feel like this encapsulates everything. Were there others of those moments? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, just so many people had moments like that, but the ones that made it into the book in particular, um, another one that really stuck out to me is there was this guy named Travis and he and his neighbors got stuck on Edgewood Lane, which is this just like very rutted, very gravelly road in the outskirts of paradise. And it got blocked off. There were a lot of people that died on that road. And so they realized that they couldn't escape. And so they tried to outrun the fire on their four wheelers. And by the oddest twist of luck, um, you know, Travis was able to jump to a different part of the fire than his two neighbors and they got really badly burned. And so he was totally fine and had to go find help for them. And again, just like one of those moments where I was like, what would I, you know, you put, I think you put yourself in, in their shoes, right? And you're like, what would I do if I was in that situation? And just like incredible heroism. Um, I don't think I could have done it, but it just, you know, people having to confront those really hard moments and decisions that are a matter of life and death. Yeah. I want to ask you about elected officials and policymakers, but first people are asking questions and I don't want to, I don't want to hog all the time to myself. (laughs) Although you certainly could. Um, In a time of increasing water shortages and drought conditions, how much of reservoir water is being used to fight fires? That's a hard question. I I wish I knew the answer to that (laughs) question. Um, You know, unfortunately, I just moved to the East Coast, so I haven't been covering fires this summer. Um, Okay, this one, this one is, this one is easier. Okay, do you still keep in touch with the people featured in your book? And how many of them are still in the Paradise area? Or have they relocated elsewhere? Yeah, I still keep in touch with everyone in the book. Um, I don't, I guess it's a spoiler, but uh, (laughs) Rochelle and her baby made it out. And she sent me the cutest video of him the other day after they had gotten the book. And, you know, it's just really nice to keep in touch because you care so much about them. Um, You know, unfortunately, a lot of them don't live in paradise anymore. For example, Kevin, the bus driver, his house burned down and he moved to Chico. He's not rebuilding. And even some of the people who thought that they would go back, they've realized that the emotional toll is just too hard. Um, The town is still really empty compared to what it was. And so their friends and their neighbors aren't there. The businesses close early. And then every summer with the rolling blackouts from PG&E and with the smoke in the sky, it just is a very triggering thing. So for the most part, I mean, 
most of the people in the book don't live in paradise anymore, I would say. One of the most incredible details in the book is early on and about what warning evacuation warnings actually made it out and which evacuation warnings didn't. Um, this is a little inside baseball, but can you tell us a little bit about how the reporting on that went when you uncovered what was happening and asking the people responsible about what happened as opposed to what was planned? Yeah. So, um, I get really obsessive about my reporting. So I just try and talk to absolutely every single person that was there that morning and read every single report that I can find. And I think one of the most damning things about that fire was the fact that so many people in town never got an evacuation alert. Um, part of that was an infrastructure thing, right? The fire was moving really fast. And so the cell towers were melting, the infrastructure was overloaded and by the time officials did try to start sending these alerts out, there was just no way for them to go through. But it also was a failure of the local government because the leaders didn't truly have a grasp of how bad the fire was going to be. They sort of wavered and went back and forth on, you know, whether they needed to evacuate people. There is this sense that um, if they tried to evacuate the entire town at once, it would cause more pandemonium than good. And they had learned that lesson through past wildfires but uh, it was the wrong lesson on the morning of the campfire. So um, there were two agencies sending out the alerts. One was Butte County. And in the office, there was only one guy there that day to send out the alerts. And he was totally overwhelmed getting um, orders from many different agencies. And so he was inundated and was sending out these alerts. And um, at one point, he tried to send out an alert via the Amber Alert style system. But the county had never tested that system, and so it didn't send, and they didn't realize it for a couple of days. So they were forced to rely on the code red system. Again, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, that's like the voluntary sign-up system. So you have to give your phone number over to get those alerts, and if you don't sign up, then you don't get the alerts. So obviously, there are some issues with that where, you know, if you don't sign up, then you, you don't know. It's um, an imperfect system. And then the same thing with the town of Paradise they were relying on that code red voluntary signup system. And they were also way behind sending alerts far later than, than they should have. And so people just didn't know. Um, they were looking for fire outside of their back doors. And that was the biggest indicator they had that it was time to leave. And has anything changed about those systems? I mean, it's, it's scattershot, right? I mean, California has 58 counties and in all of those counties, there are local jurisdictions and all of them do it slightly differently. I think that finally people are realizing that this is a big issue and that we need to have a uniform way of alerting people. We saw that during the wine country wildfires too, where people weren't properly alerted. So I think, you know, it's something that it's, that's improving, but we haven't found a good answer yet for how to do it across the entire state. Yeah. Um, this is a huge question, but can you give us just a brief overview of PG&E and accountability yeah. relative to the Paradise Fire? Yeah, of course. Okay, so um, Pacific Gas and Electric Company, obviously it's the largest utility in California, and it is so large that one in 20 Americans receive electric electricity or gas from the company, just to give you a sense of just like how enormous it is. And um pg e basically has a monopoly in the state of California and for decades prioritized profit over actually maintaining its infrastructure. Um, investigators called it a run to failure model. It's something like, you know, an analogy that they used in court was if you bought a car from 1990 and never changed the oil, never changed the tires and just drove it until it fell apart. That was the state of pg e system. So on the morning of the campfire, there was this one transmission tower in the Feather River Canyon. And on that transmission tower, there was this one hook. It had been installed over 100 years ago. It had outlived all of the men that put it up. And so that hook had been wearing away with the wind over the years until it was just held together by the barest thread of metal. And it was a pretty simple problem to fix. If pg e had been properly doing their examinations, they would have noticed it. And so the actual replacement of the part was only $19, but they didn't, they didn't catch it. And so on that morning, the hook snapped and this really heavy transmission line fell 
And when it fell, it caused a huge arc of electricity to zap the tower. And these hot metal droplets fell into the grass. And that is what started the entire fire. Um, and it, it, it like didn't come as a surprise to that many people because PG&E had caused so many disasters over the years, increasingly causing more wildfires. As we've seen, you know, this year, it seems like they're likely to have caused the Dixie Fire. Same story with the Kincaid Fire of 2020, was that last year? Um, but <laughs> they all start to blur together. Yeah. yeah. So that is PG&E and sort of a <laughs> nutshell. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> That was excellent. Okay, this question is even worse. Um, climate change and wildfire in paradise. Like, what's what's the two minute overview for listeners? Okay. For yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring that together. I wish I had a whiteboard so I could like <laughs> draw out the formula because all of these things are so knotted together. And um, you know, I get questions a lot about you know, was it just PG and E or like who is to fault? And I think it's a lot of things all together. But increasingly, climate change is uh, is something that scientists call a threat multiplier, right? So you have all of these things that already exist. You have housing in really fire-prone areas, housing that's not built to code. You have an electrical system that hasn't been hardened and is really vulnerable. You have dead and, dis- dead and diseased trees and forests that haven't been managed properly. And then with climate change, it just comes in and ups the threat of all of these things because things are hotter, they're drier, fire season lasts longer. And so it's really changing the way that we're seeing these fires act. Um, You know, it is not normal. The past five years, I feel like every single summer, these fires are topping the Cal Fire charts for biggest fire, most destructive fire, uh, deadliest fire, where if you go and look at any of those charts, it seems like they all, you know, the top five are all from at least 2017. And so climate change plays a huge role in that. Um, okay. Last huge question. <laughs> How, How many of these do you have? <laughs> my last huge question. Just, it seems important to touch on policy and, you know, a fire danger and where we've been and what we might do better. Yeah. I mean, so California is really unique in that, um, that pioneering spirit has always been here. There's that sense of manifest destiny that people can build where they want and create a life where they want. And I think we are living with that legacy now because we have put a ton of housing in places that we know has burned in the past, but that we thought we could somehow protect. And so now these are places that you know, as the climate warms and we're dealing more and more with our infrastructure not being maintained that are burning down again and again. And so, you know, we could have policy that helps make that better. But again, it's hard to tell people how to live their lives. People naturally bristle at that. Um, Even if you look at how the vaccine rollout has gone with the pandemic, it's clear that it's an imperfect system. Um, So if you think about it in terms of housing, it's very similar, right? Like people don't want to be told how to build or where to build. And unfortunately, that also plays a role in these big fires because, you know, then there's more to lose. There's all of these homes, people's entire lives tucked up in these areas that will burn again. Yeah. I imagine that dynamic would have been really true in paradise. It's not, it's a, it's a conservative community, right? Right. Right. So I imagine they, sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah. No, I was just going to say it's one that's been there for a long time, too. I think it was something like nine out of 10 homes had been built before 1990. The average home was at least 30 years old. And again, you know, I think part of it is the fact that people don't like being told what to do. And the other part of it is that places like Paradise, it's not a rich place. These, this wasn't a place where people could afford to retrofit their home or clear defensible space. So that just causes the problem to compound. Yeah. So what was reporting this book like for you? It's really, it's it's hard on reporters to hear the kinds of stories that you must have heard month after month and year after year. How, How did you get through it? Yeah. I mean, on one hand, I feel like our job, it's the greatest privilege to be able to hear people's stories and to find meaning in that, to find change. I think 
you know, we're lucky in that we can influence the conversation and get people to care and to pay attention. Mm -hmm. But I think that it is really hard to, to see these places after they've burned down and to see just how that trauma lives on. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you, you always want to believe that bad things don't happen to good people. And at a certain point, it, it's hard to believe that is a true thing anymore because you see so many good people just ensnared in this trauma that changes their life forever, where they can never live normally again. People that, you know, are homeless or in trailers or, you know, their families fall apart because they just emotionally can't handle it. And uh, that's, that's really hard because you, you want to feel like you can do more but the most you can do is to listen to them and hold space for them and hear their story and hope that that changes something. I imagine you must have been in paradise long after all the other reporters left. Um, what was it like to still be still be in town and asking people to tell their stories? It it was it was a lot of things. I'm struggling <laughs> to like say this eloquently, but, um, I spent a lot of time in paradise. You know, I went to the same Thai restaurant over and over the guy there knew me is the girl who ate the green curry, went to the grocery store. The aisles were always empty, you know, being like, who's buying bread up here. I feel like this bread shelf has been just as full as it was last week. And, um, I felt like I got to really know the place in a way that, a lot of other reporters didn't, but, um, again, that's also really hard because then you really intimately begin to understand the hurt in the place and how people were really reeling after that fire to understand that their community was gone and it wasn't coming back in the way that they thought it would. Um, it would never be the same again. And, you know, same people that you're seeing day after day, week after week and, realizing that for a lot of them, it just doesn't get better. And um, again, that's a great privilege, but it also hurts to see. Yeah. What do you hope readers take away from reading the book? Yeah. I just want them to care, right? <laughs> like, I just feel like, I mean, I started to get so numbed out after years of covering these fires where, you know, I saw so many of them firsthand and they still ran together in my head. And just hearing conversations from my friends and people in San Francisco about, oh yeah, it's another big fire. And then, you know, the, the sky is clear and the smoke goes away and you forget about it. And I think the big thing is I just want people to care about paradise and care about other towns that have suffered the same fate to realize that this is the world we're living in and this is our reality and we can't afford to not care. And, um, you know, climate change is real and it, it feels bad and, uh, we have, something has to change, but we can't change unless we know what stands to be lost. And I think paradise is the worst thing, the, the biggest thing that this state has lost to a fire in recent years. I know that you did some fire training yourself <laughs> along the way. Yeah. <laughs> what, was, what was that like? What did you learn? Yeah, um, I'm so insane about my reporting that I was like, oh, if I want to learn about fire, I should just become a firefighter, which sounded like a great idea until I actually showed up uh, at the academy and was like, wow, I feel really under-equipped for this. But basically, I um, went through an academy with a county in Northern California, and I was one of three women in a class of 50. And all of my turnout gear was about two sizes too big. Um, so I was constantly just like tripping over the ends of my pants and, you know, could barely hold up my little air tank, but I learned a lot about how firefighters think. I learned about how fire moves. Um, I got to learn how to fight fire, which was a really fascinating experience where, you know, they literally lit a field on fire and we're like, okay, go put the fire out. And, um, I think understanding staying in the black you know, I think you anecdotally hear about that, that firefighters need to stay in the burnt area to stay safe. But it's another thing when you're like chasing after a fire and the chief is yelling at you, stay in the black, stay in the black. And you're like, oh my God, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was a really informative look about 
how firefighting actually works. And it helped me translate that world a little bit better in the book. Did it feel empowering to know more about fire or terrifying or both? It made me feel safer. You know, I think as journalists, so often you're running into the fire and you don't really know what you're running into. And so I feel like I had a better grasp of how things worked. Um, it It made my writing stronger. And it also just, again, made me feel safer. It can be a little freaky sometimes. I can imagine. Okay, we're going to move over to questions from listeners. So please, you can put them in the YouTube chat and they will come over to us. Um, All right, so you were there when President Trump came to visit the area. Um, Or were you there? Sorry, I misread this question. Were you there? (laughs) No, so I actually, I took that day off. (laughs) You know, that part of the book is just incredible that he, st- he called paradise pleasure several times. Yeah. Uh, so what was it like to sort of get deep into the reporting on that and learn what he'd said and done and how it affected the community? Yeah, I mean. It just blew my mind that um, the president couldn't get the town's name right. I think that was really hurtful to a lot of people there who again had just lost so much. And then it felt like, Oh, you can't even remember the name of our town. Um, but also it's a really profound thing that that fire was so big that a sitting president actually came to paradise. And I think that just goes to show how great the disaster was. It was the biggest natural disaster in the world that year. But again, pretty like insane that he couldn't remember that it was, paradise, not pleasure. That made my heart hurt a little bit. It made my heart hurt reading that. And that somehow, I don't know, pleasure. Paradise is a incredible name of a town. Uh, and obviously it wasn't paradise, but to think it was pleasure is somehow. Yeah. Terrible. And it just, it happened more than once. And so I was like, reading through those pool reports, I was like, oh gosh. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So this is from a listener. I admire your fire reporting from the Chronicle. I do too. Uh, How did you become a fire reporter and what will you be covering at the post? Yeah. So I think like a lot of things in life, it was just a complete happenstance. I've been covering city hall for my first few years, the paper and just absolutely hated it. I hated covering <laughs> politics so much. I feel like I'm too earnest for it. And I didn't, didn't like when people yelled at me because I didn't like my story. And I was like, well, maybe, you know, you shouldn't do that bad thing. And then I wouldn't have to write that negative story about you. And so um, I got really sick of it and was like, I want to try my hand at something else. And so I moved over to the general assignment desk, not knowing what I was going to write about at all. And so that was around the time that the fires started getting really bad. Um, I was assigned to cover the fallout of the wine country wildfires of 2017 for a year. And so even after that, I was like, okay, I can do this for a year. And then I don't really know what I'm going to do after that. But then after that, the fires kept getting worse. So I just kept covering them. And it was sort of something that I stumbled into and then realized that, you know, we just in the state of California, weren't covering wildfires well, that there was so much coverage around, you know, people digging through the ashes and going back to their homes for the first time in that ticker tape of, you know, the fire is 80% contained, 100% contained, and then that's kind of all you heard. Um, So I found a lot of meaning in telling those stories of what happened after the fire and how people lived with the impacts of climate change and, you know, all of the other snarled things that caused these fires. As for what I'm covering at the post, it's a great question. (laughs) I've only been here a month. I'm on the local enterprise team, which is basically just narrative and projects. And I'm currently on the hunt trying to figure out what I I want my area of expertise to be. But brand new to the East Coast, if someone has any ideas, let me know. (laughs) You can put them in the chat. Put them in the chat. What should I write about? (laughs) Is it a relief to be away from the smoke? Yeah, it is. It is. Um, It had gotten really hard to keep covering these fires year after year. And I feel like um, I had written just about every variation of fire story that I thought I was capable of and I was ready for a new challenge. And, you know, it's also like very depressing to continue to write about such loss every single summer and to see it firsthand. So I felt like I just 
needed something new. And what was it like when the smoke from the West made it to the East coast and you were there? (laughs) Yeah. So, um, I was telling Liz right before we got on the call, I think it was my second week in DC and, um, I took my dog to the park and it smelled like smoke outside. And I was like, this can't, this can't be California fire smoke. Like I'm in DC now. And then, you know, the sky was kind of hazy and everyone at the dog park was talking about how, you know, their sunset photos were so great, but that the smoke was really annoying. And I was like, oh my God, this is, this is the fire smoke from California. I left California and it has somehow found me all the way back here. And, um, you know, that was really eerie where I almost, I got that like gut instinct kick of like, oh, I should be covering it. And then I was like, no, no, that, that chapter has closed, but yeah, so weird. It's the weirdest and thing. What did, I imagine you overheard people talking about the smoke on the East coast. Were there things you felt like you understood that they didn't understand? Yeah. I think that the big thing is from what I've found on the East coast, people view the smoke as such an annoyance and they, they like, don't get that that smoke is people's homes. It's their communities, it's their lives, it's the forest. And, um, so I had a, a good talking to, to a few people there where I was like, excuse me, that's the wrong opinion to have. <laughs> Uh, All right. Uh, This is a big question. Has PG&E made any changes to prevent fires? Okay. That's a big question. There are things that PG&E is trying. Obviously, we've heard a lot in the past few years about the rolling blackouts, Um, basically realizing that the infrastructure is vulnerable. So the company decides to shut it off during uh, red flag days, basically when it's really dry and there's high winds predicted. Um, pg and also just announced that they're undergrounding a lot of power lines across Northern California. But again, these aren't, you know, big sweeping things that will fix the fire problem. It's more like treating the symptoms. Um, so again, the, the company is trying, but it's hard to know what the actual solution is. I don't know if there, there is a good one out there that anyone knows of. Right. It seems beyond the level of a solution, at least from my own reporting, that it's there's so many factors all at once and we're so behind on all of it. Mm-hmm. Right. That's like, when you need the whiteboard. Behind. <laughs> <laughs> the forest managers are behind. We're behind in yeah. dealing with the climate crisis. Yeah. Yeah. We're living with the legacy of a lot of bad decisions that were made over the past few decades. Yes. Okay. Um, another question. How many firefighters battled the Paradise Fire? Oh, you know, I've been brushing up on all of my numbers lately, <laughs> and that was one that I did not check before this meeting, but it all is right. in the book. It's well, in the book. Kind of, <laughs> what kind of stories did you hear from, from firefighters? I imagine you talked to some along yeah. the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So firefighters came from all over the United States to help out at the Kent Fire. And so one of the biggest things that I heard from them was that uh, it was a really crazy situation where they were just told to let the homes burn. And so if you ever talk to a firefighter, they're like inbred helpers. They really want to like fix things for people. And it was just a situation where they, they couldn't, they couldn't help and they couldn't fix anything. All they could do was try and keep the roads open and try and try and help people and save their lives. Um but yeah, it goes against all of their instincts. And time after time, those firefighters would look at me and be like, yeah, I had, there was a house like right in front of me and I, I wanted to save it, but I just, I had to let it burn. And I imagine that a lot of the firefighters would have, oh, I don't know, a hard time moving on if you're, if you're a professional rescuer. Yeah. As you, as you stayed in the area and kept following people's stories, what were you hearing from the firefighters. Mm-hmm. It, yeah, it's hard to live with a fire that you couldn't fight and couldn't put out. I think um, one of the people that is is close to my heart is Matt McKenzie. He was the firefighter who first saw the campfire on the morning of November 8th. And so talking with him over the past few years, um, he eventually left his station in Jarbo Gap because he just couldn't 
drive past all of the destroyed homes day after day, he realized it was too hard. And so he moved to a station in paradise, you know, obviously still burnt, but, um, you know, that wasn't where he was stationed that day. And he was like, it, it's a fresh landscape for me, right? I don't have to drive past all of the things that I failed to protect every single morning. And um, he used to live out in the country too. And he recently moved into the city of Chico because he was like, look, I keep getting evacuated every summer. I keep losing my power. I can't live like that. Um, so even after the fire, people are still having to make these hard decisions, realizing that they can't live the lives that they once dreamed of or thought they would be living at this point. And how much can a homeowner do to protect themselves? If, if, if you live in a community like paradise, that's vulnerable. Yeah. It's always one of those questions where I'm like, well, you could do this, but you know, there are also these factors. Um, so like there are, there are things you can do, right. Having defensible space does make a difference. Basically clearing anything flammable within a hundred feet of your home so that if a fire burns up, it stops. But then, you know, if you are disabled or you don't have the money, it can be really hard to do that. Um, same thing with retrofitting your home. You know, there are things we know about housing construction that makes homes more vulnerable to fire. Like those shake roofs are really, really bad. It's bad if you have attics that are open, you need like some kind of screening on it. It's not great if your fence is attached to your home. But again, sometimes the ability to have, have the privilege of saving your home is something that's based on money. And if you don't have that, it can be really hard to protect yourself. So, you know, those are nice places to start, but it's not something that is accessible to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's see. We would love your question. <laughs> if there are more from you out there, otherwise Lizzie and I are going to chat. Um, okay. This one is tough on a reporter. What's the financial cost to battle fires like the Paradise Fire? <laughs> Yeah, they cost millions of dollars. Um, and, you know, it, it's always really hard to see that because I think if we shifted where we were putting that money and put it into more um, preventative burning and thinning and trying more to help prevent these fires, it would go a long way. But again, we're living with all of these decisions that were made over decades. And so firefighting is so reactive in that you have to like throw everything out of fire to put it out. And the price tag gets really, really big. Yeah. So one person's story that I somehow was really struck by was the mayor of paradise. Um, mm -hmm. What was it like to, to be with her in the aftermath of the fire and how did, how did she try to pull things together? Yeah. I mean, you have to remember that this was a really small town. The people that served on the town council, the woman who served as mayor, these were people that did it because they loved their community and they wanted to make it a nice place to live, not necessarily because they were, you know, the most qualified or had worked in government their entire life. And so when the campfire hit, this woman, Jody Jones, was suddenly thrust into the spotlight and was getting interviewed dozens of times a day by you know, news organizations from around the world. And um, she was totally caught off guard and tried her best. But, you know, uh, everyone wanted to know why the town wasn't prepared and why it had burned down. And she just didn't really have answers. And if you can imagine, um, I have a lot of compassion for her because I'm like, imagine like living your normal life and then one day waking up and having to answer to all of the news cameras and explain what had happened. That's just very impossible situation to be in yeah. and her home had burned down too. And, uh, you know, I think everyone, everyone on the town council, their homes had burned down. And so they were having to try and leave their community when they also were struggling to rebuild their lives. Yeah. So the fire was in early November. What was Thanksgiving like that year in paradise? Yeah. Thanksgiving was around the time the rains finally arrived. So that was a big thing with the fire is that, all of the rain came really late. Um, you know, if, if it had rained, that fire probably wouldn't have started the way that it did. And so Thanksgiving was kind of like this very bizarre milestone that had suddenly arrived during a time when nothing was normal. 
So I remember I spent Thanksgiving up at the evacuation shelters and there were some community dinners that were held at the local university. And the people there were just like, well, we we're here because we don't really have anywhere else to go. Like, what are we going to do? Sit in our hotel room and like eat McDonald's. Um, So I think people found solace in each other, but it was also a very weird thing where it's like holidays are such a tangible thing of uh, this is like what we do every year. We have traditions and the first moment of, oh, wow, everything has changed. And um, starting with this holiday, things aren't going to be normal in the same. Mm -hmm. I would imagine a lot of help of various kinds flooded into the town after um what was actually helpful to residents was it surreal to have celebrity chefs and others kind of swooping in to yeah their thing? yeah you know county officials told me that after fires like this people have the urge to help but they don't always channel it into the most productive ways so they got like all of these boxes of like prom dresses and bikinis and like a load of white Crocs to the point where they had to rent out a big warehouse to put all of this stuff. And it was the stuff that people didn't really need. People needed like toothbrushes and toothpaste and underwear. And all of that was sold out at the local superstores. When you would go walk around, it was like, there was nothing left to be found. So what people really needed was like gift cards and toiletries, that kind of a thing. Um, and you know, instead, Butte County did get some of that, but they also got inundated with a lot of stuff that they didn't need. And it became a headache for county officials to deal with in the midst of so many other, you know, pardon the pun, but small fires they were trying to put out. Yeah. Uh, I hadn't even thought of that. Then, right. Then the county, someone there has to deal with all of everybody's good yeah. bags that they hadn't brought yet or whatever else people were sending, thinking it was helpful. Exactly. They're like, well, where do we put it? Like we put it in this warehouse, but then eventually, like, I think they eventually just like trucked it to the landfill. Yeah. Um, so another question, what was the cleanup like in paradise? After yeah. That? Cleanup took a really long time. Um, it's funny, the figures that they give out, they always measure it and weigh it in terms of Golden Gate bridges. Like I remember I would get these emails in my inbox every week and it was like, we have hauled out one Golden Gate bridges weights worth of debris, right? Just to like give you an idea of how much there was to trek out. Um, Cause it was like something like 11,000 homes that burned. And so that's a lot. It's everything inside those homes. It's all the cars and you know, even a year after the fire, there were still some lots that hadn't been cleared. Um, it was complicated by the fact that Paradise wasn't a really isolated part of the region. So there were only so many landfills that you could truck the debris out to. So um, people spent a lot of time on the road. You know, they would have to go up north or go out to uh, a landfill on the outskirts of town. And then on top of that, uh, it's expensive and Again, it's just like there was a lot there. So even a year after the fact, you would drive around and still see houses where the place that was melted in the backyard and all the rebar was twisted on the ground. And you'd be like, how is this still here a year later? It looks totally untouched, like the fire had just come through. How do you think about moving forward in the world? I face these issues in my own <laughs> reporting all the time. I report on climate. It's hard to take in these stories day after day. And it feels so important to have hope. And also the world is so alarming at the yeah. same time. And I feel like balancing those two things is like the struggle <laughs> of, yeah. of trying to convey these stories. Um and I don't have any answers. Like, how do you try to balance giving hope and feeling hope yourself with actually trying to convey the extent of the crisis? Yeah. I'm really curious to know your answer on this too. <laughs> but, um, you know, the thing that I always tell myself is it if we can at least be having the same conversation and get on the same page about climate change, if, if these stories can do that, then that is something and that gives me hope. Um, 
And then of course there are like individual moments that are really awe inspiring. Like I remember after the fire that spring, there were so many wildflowers that came up through the soil. Mm -hmm. People in town talked about how they hadn't seen flowers like that in years. And um, just like bright sprays of yellow daffodils and bluebells and things like that, right? Where you're like, okay, um, the land will heal and regenerate and be better for it, even if the things that we built have not. Um, So just focusing on those things too, I think it all starts to feel very hopeless and abstract if you zoom out too much and Mm -hmm. are just utterly focused on climate change is a global problem. If you like zoom in on small efforts, it it helps a little bit, but I don't know. What do you think? How do you keep your hope alive? I had a similar experience walking up Atlas Peak Road in Napa after the, uh, the fires up there. And like you were saying, everything was so green and there were flowers everywhere. And it was, it was jarring and incredibly beautiful and hopeful. And it both gave you the sense that, you know, the world was healing, Uh, but then you come home and I come home to my job reporting on climate. You're like, "Eh, the world is not healing. We, (laughs) we need to get, as you were saying, to a place where we're all on the same page and we can, be as a collective making the moves we need to move. So I guess I I go back and forth all the time between feeling tremendous despair and feeling, no, we need hope. It's not that complicated. We need to stop burning fossil fuels. Like if we will all decide to hold people to account and make that happen, we will have taken a major step towards having a better, safer future. So to me, it's a matter of toggling back and forth, because I think if you stay on one side or the other too long, you sort of lose the way and and action starts to feel impossible. But I feel like telling these stories, particularly the way you tell them in the book, is the answer, at least to me, to tell stories like, like the ones that you're telling of individual people in their lives in ways that we can all relate to. And just imagine being that bus driver with those 22 kids and writing that manifest. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's sort of the most motivating thing to be just like, we, can, we can't do nothing. Yeah, We do nothing. There are more bus drivers writing more manifests and that should absolutely never happen. Yeah. So it's tough. <laughs> it's tough and it's critical and it's, it's just everything. Yeah. um, Do you feel like you should be back out here covering the fires or do you just feel lucky to not have to deal with the trauma? You know, I, um, half of me is always like, oh, I really, I wish I could be back doing that work. But the other half of me knows that, um, there's still more reporting to be done on topics that I haven't even discovered yet that will also be impactful and meaningful and you know, you can't pigeon yourself doing the same thing forever. Yeah. So one last question. Do you have like a dream story? Like when you, <laughs> you imagine wanting to write one day, if there's <laughs> someone listening who could sort of serve you up some perfect a dream a perfect story piece to report on, like what direction would it go? <laughs> what, would it, what would there be? I mean, obviously I I love impactful stories that say something about the world that we're living in and about the divides that exist. But I also, I would just love a dream story. That's like a happy, complex dream story where there's, you know, like an ending that doesn't make you feel utter despair. So, you know, of a really compelling story that, um, you know, will leave me going to bed with a smile on my face, that would also be great. (laughs) Yes, that would. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today's program. I want to thank Lizzie Johnson for joining us at the Commonwealth Club. I would encourage all of you to buy Lizzie's wonderful book, Paradise, One Town Struggle to Survive an American Wildfire. So this program will soon be placed on the Commonwealth Club website, www.commonwealthclub.org, and we encourage you to view it and share it. Um, Thank you for joining us. I'm Liz Weil and uh, our Commonwealth Club program is adjourned.